This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 3 for July 11 to 17, ready for teaching on Sabbath July 18, Seeing People Through Jesus' Eyes, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 11. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we come to your word to learn more about you, but also to learn about our attitude towards other people and how it can be like the attitude of Jesus, where we met people where they were and we found their needs and we served them up with love from you that shows just what you are like in our daily lives. We pray that you'll bless us as we open your word. May your Holy Spirit guide and may our lives be such that others may want to know about the lovely Jesus. We pray in his dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let's read that again. Matthew 4, verse 19. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Jesus is the master soul winner. By watching the way Jesus worked with people, we learn how to lead others to a knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ. Journeying with him through the crowded streets of Jerusalem, the dusty paths of Judea, and the grassy hillsides of Galilee, we discover how he revealed the principles of the kingdom to seeking souls. Jesus saw all men and women as winnable for his kingdom. He saw each one through the eyes of divine compassion. He saw Peter not as a rough, loud-mouthed fisherman, but as a mighty preacher of the gospel. He saw James and John not as quick-tempered, fiery radicals, but as enthusiastic proclaimers of his grace. He saw the deep yearning for genuine love and acceptance in the hearts of Mary Magdalene, the Samaritan woman, and the woman with the issue of blood. He saw Thomas not as a cynical doubter, but as one with sincere questions. Whether they were Jew or Gentile, male or female, a thief on the cross, a centurion, or a demon-possessed madman, Jesus saw their God-given potential and viewed them through salvation's eyes. Sunday, July 12, The Second Touch There is only one miracle in the entire Bible that Jesus worked in two stages. It is the healing of the blind man of Bethsaida. This story provides timeless lessons for Christ's church today. It illustrates God's plans of using each believer to bring someone else to Jesus. Scripture declares, Then he came to Bethsaida, And they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. Mark 8.22 The two key words here are brought and begged. The blind man did not come on his own. His friends saw his need and brought him. He may not have had much faith, but they did. They believed that Jesus would heal this man's blindness. There are approximately 25 distinct healing miracles in the New Testament performed by Jesus. In more than half, a relative or friend brings the individual to Jesus for healing. Many people will never come to Jesus unless someone who has faith brings them. Our role is to become an introducer and bring people to Jesus. The second word that is worthy of our consideration in Mark 8.22 is the word begged. It can mean beseech, implore, or exhort. It implies a softer, kinder, gentler appeal than a loud, boisterous demand. The friends of this man kindly appealed to Jesus, believing that he had both the desire and the power to help this man. The man may not have had faith that Jesus could heal him, but his friends did. Sometimes, We must carry others to Jesus on the wings of our faith. Question, read Mark chapter 8, verses 22 to 26. 
Why do you think he healed the blind man in two stages? What lessons does this story have for us today as witnesses for Jesus? Mark 8, beginning at verse 22, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. Then he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell anyone in the town. Is it possible that we too do not see people clearly? Do we sometimes see them more like trees walking, in vague, shadowy forms, rather than as candidates for the kingdom of God? What do you think leads us at times not to see people clearly? So to finish today, besides the obvious lesson that God uses us to reach people, what else can we learn from this story? What might it teach us, for instance, about how both the medical and the spiritual can have a part in healing and in ministry to the lost? Monday, July 13. A Lesson in Acceptance By modelling for them what it meant to see each individual from a new perspective, Jesus taught his disciples how to see people through heaven's eyes. His view of people was radical. He saw them not as they were, but as they might become. In all his interactions with people, he treated them with dignity and respect. Often he surprised his disciples by the way he treated people. This is especially true in his interaction with the Samaritan woman. The Archaeological Study Bible makes this interesting observation about the relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans on page 1727. The rift between the Samaritans and the Judeans dates from an early period. According to 2 Kings 17, the Samaritans were descendants of Mesopotamian peoples who were forcibly settled in the lands of northern Israel by the king of Assyria in the wake of the exile in 722 BC. They combined the worship of Yahweh with idolatrous practices. End of quote. In addition to these idolatrous practices, they established a rival priesthood and a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Considering such theological differences with the Samaritans, the disciples must have been perplexed when Jesus chose the Samaritan route to Galilee. They were surprised that Jesus did not allow himself to be drawn into a religious debate. He appealed directly to the Samaritan woman's longing for acceptance, love and forgiveness. Question, read John chapter 4, verses 3 to 34. How did Jesus approach the Samaritan woman? What was the woman's response to Christ's conversation with her? What was the disciples' response to this experience? And how did Jesus broaden their vision? John 4, beginning at verse 3, He left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. 
Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have said well, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, in that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and the Jews saw that in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point his disciples came, and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. In the meantime his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish his work. The eternal lesson that Jesus longed to teach his disciples, and each one of us, is simply this. And Ellen White writes this in The Signs of the Times, June 20, in 1892. Those who have the Spirit of Christ will see all men through the eyes of divine compassion. So to finish today. Who are the people whom, due to the influence of your own culture and society, you tend to view disdainfully or with a lack of respect? Why must you change your attitude, and how can that change come? Tuesday, July 14, begin where you are. Someone has rightly said, In life, the only place to start from is where you are, for there is no other place to begin. Jesus emphasized this principle in Acts 1.8, in which he declared, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Jesus' message to his disciples was too plain to be misunderstood, being where you are. Witness where God has planted you. Rather than dreaming of better opportunities, start with those around you. See with divine eyes the possibilities closest to you. You don't need to be the most educated person in the world, the most eloquent, the most gifted. However helpful some of these gifts could be, if rightly used, in the end, all you need is your own love of God and your love for souls. If you are willing to witness, God will open the way for you to do so. 
Question. Read John one forty and forty one, John six five to eleven, and John twelve twenty to twenty six. What do these passages tell you about both Andrew's spiritual eyesight and his approach to witnessing? John one, beginning at verse forty, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah which is translated, the Christ. And John 6, beginning at verse 5, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Twelve hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about five thousand. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise of the fish, as many as they wanted. And John 12, beginning at verse 20, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Jesus came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honour. Andrew's experience speaks volumes to us. He began in his own family. He first shared Christ with his brother Peter. He developed a cordial relationship with a little boy who then provided Jesus with the material for a miracle. And Andrew also knew just what to do with the Greeks. Rather than debate theology, he sensed their need and introduced them to Jesus. The art of effective soul winning is the art of building positive, caring relationships. Think about the people closest to you who may not know Jesus. Do they sense in your life someone who is compassionate and caring? Do they see in you a peace and purpose that they long for? Is your life an advertisement for the gospel? We make friends for God by sharing Jesus. They become Christian friends and eventually, as we share God's end-time message of biblical truth, they may become Seventh-day Adventist Christians as well. So to finish the day, why can it be so difficult at times to lead our family members and relatives to Christ? Have you been successful in sharing Jesus with any of your family members or close friends? Share any principles that the class might find helpful. Wednesday, July 15. Dealing with Difficult People Jesus was a master at dealing with difficult people. By both his words and actions, he demonstrated acceptance. He listened sensitively to their concerns, raised questions, and gradually revealed divine truths. He recognized the inner longing in the most hardened hearts and saw potential in the vilest sinners. For Jesus, no one was beyond the reach of the gospel. Jesus certainly believed that, as uh, we read in uh, Desire of Ages, page 258, none have fallen so low, none are so vile, but that they can find deliverance in Christ. Jesus looked at people through a different set of lenses than the rest of us do. 
He saw in each human being a reflection of the glory of the original creation. He raised their thinking to grasp the possibility of what they might become, and many rose to meet his expectations for their lives. Question. Read Matthew four eighteen and 19, Mark twelve twenty eight to 34, and Luke twenty three thirty nine to 43. What do you find similar in Christ's appeals to Peter and John, an unnamed questioning scribe, and the thief on the cross? Study Christ's approach to each of these carefully. What stands out to you, Matthew 4, beginning at verse 18? And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Mark 12, beginning at verse 28. Then one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, Which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment, and the second is like it. It is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God, and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. And Luke 23, beginning at verse 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Everywhere Jesus went, he saw spiritual possibilities. He saw potential candidates for the kingdom of God in the most unlikely circumstances. We call this ability church growth eyes. Church growth eyes are a cultivated sensitivity to see people as Jesus saw them, as winnable for the kingdom of God. This also involves church growth ears, which has to do with listening to the unspoken needs of those around us. It has to do with listening to their hearts longing for something they do not have, even if they have not openly expressed it. Ask the Lord to make you sensitive to the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the lives of others. Pray that God will give you the second touch and open your eyes to the spiritual opportunities He brings before you each day to share your faith with others. Seek God for a seeing eye, a listening, sensitive heart, and a willingness to share the Christ you know and love with others, and you will be on your way to an exciting journey of a lifetime. Life will take on a whole new meaning. You will have a sense of satisfaction and joy that you have never experienced before. Only those who work for souls can know the satisfaction it can bring. Thursday, July 17, Sensing Providential Opportunities The book of Acts is filled with stories of how the disciples took advantage of providential opportunities for the advancement of God's kingdom. From one end of the earth to the other, we read fascinating accounts of the early church and how it grew, even despite challenges it faced both internally and externally. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, for example, the Apostle Paul tells his experience at Troas. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I did not find Titus my brother. But, taking my leave of them, I departed for Macedonia. God miraculously opened a door for Paul to preach the gospel on the European continent, and he knew that the doors God opens today might shut tomorrow. Seizing the opportunity and seeing the possibilities, he immediately sailed for Macedonia. The God of the New Testament is the God of the open door, the God who provides providential opportunities for us to share our faith. Throughout the book of Acts, God is at work. There are open doors in cities, in provinces, in countries, and most of all, in individual hearts. Question. Read Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 38. What do these verses teach about Philip's openness to God's leading and his responsiveness to divine opportunities? Acts 8, beginning at verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And, sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near, and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him, and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture where he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. In the book, The Acts of the Apostles, page 109, we read, An angel guided Philip to the one who was seeking for light and who was ready to receive the gospel. And today angels will guide the footsteps of those workers who will allow the Holy Spirit to sanctify their tongues and refine and ennoble their hearts. The angel sent to Philip could himself have done the work for the Ethiopian, but this is not God's way of working. It is his plan that men are to work for their fellow men. End of quote. If we have ears to hear and eyes to see, we too will be guided by unseen angels to reach truth seekers with the truths of the kingdom. So to finish today, notice how central the scriptures were in this story. Also notice how at this point it was so important for someone who knew the scriptures to expound on them. What lessons are here for us? Friday, July 17. All around us, people are seeking for the things of eternity. 
As Jesus so aptly put it in Matthew 9.37, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labourers are few. The problem, therefore, was not with the harvest. With eyes divinely anointed, Jesus saw a plentiful harvest where the disciples saw only opposition. What was Christ's solution to the problem? In the following verse, Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labourers into his harvest. The solution is to pray that God will send you out into his harvest. Why not pray this prayer? Lord, I am willing to be used for the advancement of your kingdom. Open my eyes so that I can see the providential opportunities. You are opening before me each day. Teach me to be sensitive to the people around me. Help me to speak words of hope and encouragement and share your love and truth with those I come in contact with each day. If you will pray this prayer, God will do some extraordinary things with your life. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, if you have worked to bring souls to Jesus, there is one thing you know. It is not always easy, is it? Yes, of course, only God can convert hearts. But in his wisdom, he has chosen to use us to be part of that process. To work for even one soul takes time, effort, patience, and a love born from above. What choices can you make that will help you have the death to self that you need in order to be an effective witness for Christ? Two, who are some of the people you come in contact with who don't know the Lord? What have you done or are doing or should do to witness to them? Three, think about Saul of Tarsus. Here is someone who appeared to be about as unlikely a convert as one could imagine. And yet, we know what happened to him. What should this tell us about the danger of too quickly judging others by outward appearances? 4. Keeping in mind the story of Saul, how should we interpret a text like Matthew 7, verse 6? Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet, and turn and tear you to pieces. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Filipino Family Transformed and it's by Stephen Dragu. A lonely literature evangelist walked the dusty hot streets of Bataan City in the Philippines. All day he toiled, yet he sold nothing. This was his only source of income. So he was a little discouraged, but he determined to knock on one more door. As he approached, he prayed, then he knocked. A slight woman with keen eyes greeted the tired man with a smile. He made his heavenly pitch, and she could see the sincerity in his eyes and heart in his voice. It was as if the Holy Spirit himself was pleading with the woman. She was a Christian, but she had squandered years with no deep interest in pursuing Christ. When the family's financial situation became grave, the woman began to hunger to learn more about Jesus. But her pockets were always empty. She had ten children, and three more would be on the way. How could she afford the literature evangelist book, which she knew she just had to read and share? The book was called The Great Controversy and was written by Ellen White. Without hesitation, she bought that book with resources that she did not have. More than fifty years have passed since that day, but the fruit of that singular book is still being felt. The woman, Epiphania Tai, led every single one of her children to Christ. She surely believed, as Ellen White wrote in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 429, that our work for Christ is to begin with the family in the home. There is no missionary field more important than this. 
One of her sons, Florente Tai, became a pastor and now is the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Philippine Publishing House in Manila. Others became deacons, elders, deaconesses and teachers in Adventist churches and academies. Nearly all graduated from Mountain View College and each one who did helped the next one go to that college. I know this woman as mum. I married one of her daughters, Dorcas, who has taught at Adventist academies all her life. Mum had a stroke before I met her. She was mute, blind and bedridden. She tried with all her heart to talk to me at our first meeting, but could not. That does not really matter. She already has spoken to my heart many times because she responded to the Holy Spirit many years earlier. She died in August 2013 at the age of 89. Dozens of people have come to Christ because of a lonely literature evangelist, a powerful book, and a woman receptive to the Holy Spirit. I'll see her on that appointed day. And there's a photo here of Stephen Dragoo, pictured with Dorcas, his wife, and he's a Bible worker and evangelist in Christianburg in Virginia, in the United States. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.